Hi, this is Ronald Johnson, your life coach, mentor coach. And what I do is I help people that are tired of who they are and where they are in life. And this is Gloria, your life coach. I help those who are feeling stuck, struggling with difficulties such as self-doubt, inner judgment, lack of confidence, life transitions, and taking steps forward. And welcome to Life's A Shuffle podcast. Now, you may wonder why it's called Life's A Shuffle. And the reason why we came up with this title was that life is really shuffling. And it doesn't matter where you come from, your background, what age you are, you're shuffling multiple things in life. And the best thing to know in life is everybody faces your struggles and everybody faces what you're going through. But there's hope in learning something about that. So when our guests share their journey, the hope is you learn something in that journey so yourself can navigate the struggles you face, the low self-esteem, the self-confidence. And that's why we call podcast Life's a Shuffle. And throughout this podcast, we share our personal overcoming stories, as well as our guests who shares their personal journey in overcoming their personal struggles. Life's a Shuffle podcast is here to connect like-minded individuals. And thank you for listening to Life's a Shuffle podcast. Hi, this is Gloria, life coach and meditation coach. Welcome to another episode of Life's a Shuffle. Hi, this is Ronald Johnson, your life coach and soon-to-be psychologist. And welcome to another episode of Life's a Shuffle. And on Life's a Shuffle, you know we love our guests. We love hearing their stories. This creates that energy, that passion, and just co-creating the life they want because we love hearing stories. So we have another special guest, Rob Temple all the way from the UK, here to tell us about his journey, who he is. He seems like he's ambitions, he's willingness. And Rob, you know what? It's all you, buddy. Take it away. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. I'm very excited about oh, this. Welcome, Rob. Welcome. You're welcome. Welcome. Thanks for coming and taking the time. Max, I think you said earlier, it's 9 a.m. our time, and I think it's 5 p.m. your time. So it's yeah. almost dinner time. Oh, I'm, in the, I'm in the future, basically. <laughs> you are. <laughs> It's going to be a good day. <laughs> it's going to be an awesome day. Awesome day. So tell us about yourself. Where are you from? Yeah. So I live in the northeast of England, like an hour and a half south of the, of the border between England and Scotland. And um, I, I have like a, a bit of a weird story. Um, so I'm definitely, I'm definitely like a regular guy, except I've done some irregular things. I, I actually work as two parts to my life. I work as a stage hypnotist. So if you've ever seen one of those hypnosis shows where they get people on stage and hypnotize them and turn them into superstars for an hour and a half and then send them back mm-hmm. to the audience, that's what I do. Um, and I, I was really lucky, I think, that I very early on in life knew what I wanted to do. So I came straight out of school. So like just before university in the UK, we have these things called A-levels, these exams that you do at like 17, 18. And alongside those, um, I was studying for those i was also doing my show and starting to build that business and so then i left school and went straight into doing that and i just skipped university as a sort of gap year just to see how it worked and and it, it played out pretty well so i just kept going so that's one side of my life but along along growing up i i was very aware as a kid for some reason i was uber aware that as a kid i was like very shy and very quiet and um it wasn't I, I didn't get bullied and i you know i had some friends i wasn't unpopular but i just never quite felt like i fit in with everybody else i didn't like the sports that all the sporty people liked and i didn't like all the popular fashion stuff that all the popular fashion people liked so i never really felt like i fit in particularly well i was also born in the south of england and moved up north so i had this very southern accent and then i was thrown in into a, a school of kids where they all spoke with a northeastern accent which is so different and so this is what was going on and i was trying to make sense of the world and my life and what i wanted to do and the fact that when all of the other kids had quite normal ambitions like you know they wanted to be like train drivers or princesses or whatever kids wanted to be at that age i just knew that i wanted to be an entertainer of some description i wanted to be up on stage which seems like a wildly ambitious thing to do for somebody who's so shy and terrified and quiet and it was really i was really put on the spot one day when um, my stepmom's friend ran like a, a brownie troupe, you know, brownies and girl guides. And uh, they asked me to go and do a little magic show for them because I was into magic at the time. And I was like, okay, cool, I can do that. I was probably like 10 and these kids are all like 10 as well. So I, they stick me there, this 10-year-old lad in front of these 10-year-old girls and I'm there about to do this magic show. And suddenly, just as I'm about to go, I just freeze. I couldn't speak, couldn't say anything. I could move. I wasn't paralyzed, but like my, no words would come out of my mouth. And uh, I'm about, and this is my first opportunity to really do what you might consider to be a little performance of some description. 
And uh, in the end, my stepmom had to stand there and do all of the words and like the talking bits. And I just stood there and silently like demonstrated these magic tricks in the most sad display you've ever seen. Anyway, I got in the car, we drove home and I just burst into tears, really, really disappointed that actually now it looks like the one thing I want to spend my life doing, I'm probably not good enough to do. I probably can't do. And of course, I had no idea at the time, but my little brain would have been filled. My little 10 year old brain would have been filled with, uh, you know, feelings of self doubt and negativity and all the negative stories that we start to tell ourselves about I can't and I'm not good enough and I'll never be able to and all of that. Anyway, over a period of time, I managed to resolve that. And we can unpack that throughout this if you like, but start, managed to resolve that and managed to turn entertainment into a career. And it was only about five or six, five, six, maybe 10 years ago. I'd been doing this for quite a long time. And I looked back over it and I thought, it's interesting when you assess the, the little kid that I was and the, 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 the guy that I've become growing up, it's quite interesting when you assess the differences. And I started to look at kind of what I was doing, what I'd done completely accidentally, I think. Um, to re- kind of reprogram the way that I am from this shy, terrified, nervous kid into somebody who is actually very confident. Um, I'm an introvert, so I don't like love striking up conversations and talking for ages, but I uh, certainly am confident and I believe in myself and I've got big goals and I, I've achieved a bunch of them and uh, things are going in the right direction. And it's interesting to see how you go from from being that shy, terrified kid who doesn't fit in uh, through being a shy, terrified teenager who finds all of that quite difficult through actually being quite confident. And when I was doing it, I was I realized that there are some real parallels between that, what, what happened in my life, like my story, and me as a stage hypnotist. Because I take really shy, retiring, ordinary members of the public who volunteer to take part in a show, some of them not even thinking it's going to work, hypnotize them, plant a seed in their brain that suddenly this you know regular guy, I don't know, Kevin, is suddenly Elvis Presley and he gets up on stage and he's swinging his legs around the place with a big guitar and he thinks in that moment in his mind, his 100% reality tells him that he's Elvis Presley. So of course he's not nervous, he's not shy, he's got no inhibitions. He performs I mean, not well, but he performs as if he was like with all of the, you know, you know, they say like dance, dance as though nobody's watching, right? He is really going for it. He believes that he is the king of rock and roll and everybody's watching him. And it came to realize that even though that's quite a sort of a trivial fun thing that's done for entertainment, it did make me realize that, wow, if we can, if we can take a, a regular guy or regular woman and just plant a seed, a thought, an idea, a concept into their mind and then let it water and grow that quickly, So that for three and a half minutes or however long that track of music is, that person thinks that they are some, you know, global celebrity, some global superstar. Wouldn't it be incredible if we could use the same stuff in our everyday lives just to become 1% happier, 1% more confident, 1% more motivated, 1% more fulfilled, 1% whatever it is that somebody wants to achieve. And so again, just by kind of unpacking it, I began to realize that Actually, what I do on stage every night that I do my show is actually really the same thing that we could do in our everyday lives. We don't even need to use hypnosis for it, just the the power of suggestion. Hypnosis is just suggestion well applied. And so I became obsessed with all of that. So that started this second journey in my life that runs side by side. So half my life, I work as a stage hypnotist, performing and traveling around the place. And when I'm not doing that, because obviously you spend a lot of time traveling and sitting around waiting to do a show, and then you spend like an hour and a half or two hours on stage. When I'm not doing that, I love researching and teaching and writing and speaking and doing anything that I can about about how to apply this stuff in your everyday life and how the mind works from my perspective um, and what I think people should do if they want to install better habits, become happier, more fulfilled and all of that. So long answer, but that's who I am. That's what I do. That's my background. And I guess that that's what brings me to Life's a Shuffle, right? Yeah, you know what? <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, you know, um, a story long, millions of books plays movies are talked about stories and we all love stories i mean it's like i'm listening to your story i'm saying to myself was he the only child uh, what made him be introvert um what made him go this direction he went contrary to the idea of okay simple get your high school education at least in the u.s go to college get a job and that's kind of it you you want a totally different uh um a way and and what was that moment like when it's like i want to do something different yeah, I mean, a lot of that comes from my surroundings. So I have a slightly, so um, in terms of the, I'll, I'll pick up the only child thing. I'm not exactly, but I might as well have been. So I have two half brothers who are much older than me. So like the younger of the two is about 12 years older than me. And the elder of the two is like 14 years older than me. So whilst mm, they were like, they were, they were around as I was growing up, 
Um, they have a different dad to me, but they were they were around as I was growing up, and they were super cool. And we got on, and they used to take me to the park and stuff. But like very quickly, they they you know they were off dating girls, and like it's a very different life when I'm like eight or nine or ten or whatever. And so um, yeah, big difference. So I might as well have been an only child in that respect. But what I did have around me was really supportive family. So um, the minute the minute my parents saw that what I wanted to do was to be an entertainer. They just kind of put everything behind me, even though that's like one of those jobs that as you know, a kid says, oh, I want to do this or I want to do that. A lot of the time, those are the things that parents tend to say, oh, well, that's nice. You know, that's nice. But you know, that's not a, that's not a real job. You know, like if you ever speak to a comedian or an actor or any of those people in performance, generally, they'll tend to say, you know, that they told their parents what they wanted to do. And their parents sort of said, oh, you know, well, you know, that's nice. And you can tell, you know, the sort of sarcastic, all oh, right, well, that's lovely, but that's, you know, that's not a real job. You've got to like be a teacher or a doctor or a, you know, a lawyer or work in a shop or something like you'll have to get a job. And um, my parents just sort of didn't. My parents just sort of said, great. Well, if that's what you want to do, then try that. Obviously, you want to you want to work hard at school and you want to do some other stuff because, you know, that might not work out. You, you want to have a backup, but like you might as well try. And so it actually came. I was always told by everybody else except my parents, so all of the adults around me in my life, a lot of them in the entertainment industry, they said, that to be an entertainer was a risky thing and that what you and most people will never make it and that what you should, and that's true and what you should do is you should go to school go to college go to university get a degree take the degree use it to get a job work in that job and start doing entertainment sort of as a side hustle as it's now become known it wasn't then but as a side hustle and then if it takes off then you can quit your job and and you know once you've replaced your income or you're pretty close to it and it looks pretty stable and my parents didn't i got to to the the point where you start sort of start choosing what you might do at university and my parents just said um take a gap year and see what happens you know loads of people take a gap year and with no money they put a backpack on their back and they travel around the world and they figure it out as they go and they go and work in elephant sanctuaries in cambodia and they go off and tour around africa and they go to australia and they do all these or america and they do these amazing things and then they come back and yes, they've got no money and yes, they're like tired and yes, they're drained, but they've had incredible experiences. And then they go and sort of pursue university or a job or whatever. And my parents said, look, you've done A-levels now. That's the tricky bit. It's harder to come back later in life and do your A-levels in the UK, but you can definitely go back to university at any time um, as a mature student. So they were like, you've got nothing to lose. Like just take a gap year and see what happens. And I did. And It's one of the things I always break confidence down to them. Um, the sort of the things that get in people's way in terms of their confidence comes down to four things primarily. And uh, one of them is your environment and the people around you. And I was really lucky uh, to be, to have in my immediate environment with my parents. Um, I was really lucky that, that they were very supportive and just said, well, if you want to do that, then try that. The quickest thing to do to try that is not to go to university and rack up like a hundred grand's worth of debt uh, and, and get a degree for a job you probably don't want. Um, and probably won't enjoy the quickest route to see if it works is actually just to try it now while you've got no commitments, no kids, you're not married, like just go for it and see what happens. And so, um, so I did. So I really believe that one of the key defining factors of who I am and who generally confident, successful people are is the environment that they, that they're surrounded by. And if you're surrounded by a toxic or difficult or a different environment that slows you down, then that really has an impact, not just on your opportunities. It has an obvious impact on your sort of physical opportunities. If you don't have we don't have a supportive network around you, but it has a particular impact on the internal stuff, on the internal wiring, the stories you tell yourself. Again, the you know the the um, the self talk in your head, the beliefs that you have, all of that stuff. Wow, yeah, you know that's very. I'm glad that you mentioned that here because that's very very important to have that that kind of um, support system at home. Because usually that support system you look for at home, for the most part. And I'm glad that your parents and happy to hear that your parents was able to support you in any way. Um, they believe in you, you know, and, and it's true. Would, would they rather put you in university and spend all those money and you're not happy? So they would rather have you do whatever you're happy with and when you're happy at. Um, that is, um, I think the support system at home is very important because I think that's always the first thing that we look for is support from home. So true. I was going to yeah. second that. I, I was I was looking, I was kind of anticipating a story around. I told my parents what I wanted to do, and they are like, no, that's just fun. That's a hobby. Don't consider that. You follow a traditional trajectory, which is you go to university, get a job, and if the job works out and you make enough money, then you can pursue the things you enjoy. That's why I was kind of looking forward to hearing that story. But when... Um, 
when that went when that went other other way, I was like, oh, super super surprised. You know, that it actually went the other direction. Yeah, so, and typically pe- people are generally surprised when I say that. I think it's a I think it's an exceptional thing. Uh, I think it's an unusual thing. I think that is the situation as, as you mapped it out for the for, uh, for most people, um, which is a, a shame, you know. And I think. Uh, hopefully people listening to this will start to realize that if they've got kids and they're raising kids towards that age, then hopefully they could see, actually, maybe, I, maybe I can handle this differently. Um, and likewise, if there's kids growing up now who think, well, one day, you know, teenagers listening now who think, well, one day I'll have kids and I'll have to like, I, w- I really want to start a change in the way that people, uh, think about life. And I think it's because it's a generational thing, right? There's a, there's a set of generations who were raised to think that almost life was an inconvenience. So like, well, you know, you have no choice in being born, right? So your parents make decisions and that results in you being born and you really had no say in the matter. You just were born and that's that. And 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 it's almost like an inconvenience and, and it's you have to just get on with it and you have to do what the world says because that's what's always been done. You have to go to school, you have to go to college, you have to work hard, you have to work 60 hours a week just to be mildly happy and all the, the, this kind of rules of life because that's that's how it's how the previous generations have been raised. And, and I think, you know, if you look at the amount of, of talk now about mental health and self-improvement and self-development and the stuff that's going on, the conversations that are happening in the world now are indicative of the fact that that is starting to shift. I think it's a long way from shifting as far as it should be to becoming like a mainstream way of thinking. But it's definitely starting to shift from like when my parents were kids or when their parents were kids. And so... I think that the the power of that positive conversation heading in the right direction is essential for general happiness. I think most people don't believe that they have the sort of permission to be happy and thriving and enjoying themselves. I think most people think that they have to sort of serve the world first. And I don't mean that in a, in a sort of, um, giving back sense. I mean, they have to like, just get on with their lives and be, you know, life is what it is and it might be rubbish sometimes and nothing you can do about it. You've just got to get on with it. And if, if you get served up a little bit of happiness every now and then, then just treat that as a little bonus, pop that in your pocket and remember it. And actually I think really we have to flip that on its head. We really do have to start thinking about life differently and realizing that actually, do you know what? Sure. There are hard times in life. There's rubbish that we go through. There's things that are difficult, but the, the, as a baseline, we should be happy. And as a baseline, we should be fulfilled. And as a baseline, we should wake up every day and kind of, um, smell the freshly cooked grass and enjoy ourselves and go out and do the things we want to do. And sure, there's going to be some stuff you've got to do around that you don't want to do. You might have days in your job that you don't like. You might have a job that you fundamentally don't like, but you can still face it with a sense of happiness and confidence and feeling like you're moving in the right direction and a good direction. And again, it's a a huge cultural shift that I think is starting to happen. It's a long way from happening as far as it should be. And I'm lucky enough to just felt that way. It is. You know what? And I think also with um, with the pandemic that, you know, we're going through that, I think also to, for some that made it helped them shift because, you know, it's not always going to be flowing perfectly. We're not. Nobody's perfect. We don't have a perfect life. But, you know, there's always going to be obstacles and changes, challenges that we'll be facing and it's how you overcome it. And we just need to understand and realize that it's not always going to be flowing perfect so true you know tell, tell me this idea about happiness you know i coach clients full time so that's what i do i'm a mental health coach and i have my own practice called rj health and fitness sorry rj of level life coaching and, and what i what i've noticed is is i'm gonna hear your perspective on this but i've noticed is that as human beings our nature is to strive that means striving after the happiness that means getting promoted Graduating college, getting that job, getting married, having kids, um, let's say making more money, uh, buying that big house, investing. You know, we all we all pursue of this external happiness of validation. But what do people do, like from your experience, your perspective, when these ideas are implanted and they don't they don't hit, you don't make these goals. What what do people do in your perspective? I think there's a few issues. I think the first thing is that people often think they are striving for happiness and a lot of the time they're really not. They're sort of um, plodding on through life and hoping that happiness is handed to them and they try to look for it in the wrong places for a few reasons. One of them is the fact that I think we have this cultural idea of what happiness is and we feel like we have to fit that mold. So a lot of the time people are you know, striving after happiness as they think it is. But actually when they get there, they realize that actually, if, if they ever get there, when they get there, they realize that actually this was sort of 
this was sort of somebody else's idea of happiness. This was like, and I think that's how the world got into a bit of a mess in terms of mental health and, and happiness anyway, is the fact that so many people were pursuing somebody else's idea of happiness. If you look at sort of the concept of, you know, corporate America and co- the corporate world, a lot of that was sold down to people as being like a really happy place to be. You get this amazing supportive environment when actually it's not, and it's a dog eat dog world. And actually you get paid really, really well. And actually it's not because life's constantly getting expensive, more expensive and pay doesn't, it it's, doesn't move to increase that. And gen- generally speaking, I think most people are chasing after their, what their idea of happiness is, but it's actually somebody else's idea of happiness. So I think that's the first thing. Um, and then the second thing is, I think most of the time, most of the world are so busy in the day-to-day humdrum and the day-to-day hustle and bustle that actually they don't really have the time, or at least take the time. They don't have the time, but most people don't take the time to stop and say, actually, is this ship sailing in the right direction? Um, is this is this heading to where I want to be? And if not, do I need to course correct? And and then don't take action quickly quickly enough on that concept. So if you are constantly sailing in the direction of where you think happiness is, right? So you get your big pirate map out and you lay it on the table and you go, right, we're, we're here in our little ship of happiness. And if we look over there, that's where I think the treasure is buried, right? That's where I think that's where I think I want to be. That's where I think we need to go and dig and find this treasure. And that's where happiness is, right? So they sail their, their pirate ship over to try and find this um, find this happiness. And actually, a lot of the time, when they get there, it wasn't what they thought it was going to be. They're not paying sufficient attention quickly enough that the signs are um, going to take root. So for example, I think one of the things we tend to do is we tend to think, right, I'll set this goal. And when I achieve that goal, I'm going to be happy. And that goal might be a particular relationship with a particular type of person. It might be uh, you know, a financial goal. It could be, I want to live in this type of house with this type of car and surround myself with these types of people. And then what happens is we start building a life that takes us in that direction because that's like where we decided we want to go and every day is a bit of a struggle and we don't like it very much and we're not enjoying the path all the way there and we're not enjoying any second of it i'm not enjoying today and i woke up tomorrow and i didn't enjoy that either and the problem with that is that that is instantly a sign that something is wrong because for me happiness isn't about one place that you'll be someday or something where you'll be successful like i think if i if I, if I, if I could imagine 10 years ago being where I am now and doing what I'm doing now, 10 years ago, I would be like over the moon. I would be so excited. I'd be thinking, this is amazing. I'd be jumping in the air going, oh, wow. When it gets to 2022, I'm going to be doing that. My life's going to look like this. I'm going to be in this position. I'm going to have this money. I'm going to have that house. I'm going to do that. I mean, if I could picture my life now, 10 years ago, that would be like, I've made it. That's where I want to be. But now that I'm here in 2022, surrounded by those things, it's okay. Like, but it's not, it's not actually where I want to be. I've actually set goals now that I'm much further down the road. And in 10 years time, if I meet some of those goals, then I'm going to look back at 2022 and say, oh, wow, I I would have been, I would have been overjoyed to think that I could have had this life now. Uh, But actually now I'm in it. It's sort of just, just is what it is. And it's because, you know, we expand space to fill what we've got. We expand our lives to to fit what we've got. We expand our ambitions beyond what we've got. And so because of all of that, um, it actually kind of means that happiness, the perpetual chase of happiness further away and the treasure that we're hoping to find buried somewhere else in the ocean is perpetually making us unhappy today. And so for me, if you're headed towards some goal, right, if you're headed on some mission to like, that's where I want, that's what I want my life to be. I want to be married. I want to have two kids. I want to have a car. I want to have that house. I want to be comfortably, comfortably well off. I want to have this, that, and the other. If you're focused on all of those things today and thinking about that right now, then, and you're not enjoying every day on the way there, even when it's difficult, that tells me you're heading in the wrong, you're most likely heading in the wrong direction because you have to find happiness on the, on the path to that thing and on the route to that thing. Because otherwise when you get there, it's, it's all just going to kind of not, not really be worth all of this unhappiness that you've gone through in order to get there. Because when you get there, you'll set new goals and you've just got to do it all over again. And so instead of having like one spike of happiness when you get there, and then it sort of falls flat and then another spike of happiness in 10 years time, when you get there and that, and then that falls flat, you've got to find happiness on the way and you've got to enjoy the process and you've got to enjoy the struggles. Truthfully, you've got to, you've got to make sure you're headed in that right journey. Otherwise it's always going to be disappointing. Wow, I like that. So it's, I think it's, um, I like how you touch on that because we get so caught up with, um, with the hustle and bustle of life, and we don't really take the time to, we don't take the time for ourselves to really think, 
think about who we want to be and who we are. Think about what makes us happy in life and what doesn't. And to even just think about where we want to go and what we want to do in life, right? So you mentioned um, that you're where you are, but not quite exactly where you want to be. Where would you like to be? Where do you see yourself from? Um, it's very interesting. So again, if you if if you flip that question back around, I would like to be doing what I'm doing now, but at a, a bigger level. So I'd like to still be doing my shows, but doing it at a bigger level. I'd like to still be selling my personal development stuff, but doing it at a bigger level. I'd like to still be, um, you know, with the friendships and the the support groups that I've got now, but again, doing those at an even bigger level. And, and again, because of that, I know that if I, if and when I reach those goals, I'm just going to set them to be even bigger again. Because I think as humans, enough is rarely enough because even if you get to the point where you have enough you want to be able to like give back and do more and support bigger causes in a bigger way and that requires you to have more because you haven't you've got enough for you but you don't have enough to be able to plow all of that back and so i think as humans we're, we're innately programmed to constantly be looking for the next thing which is it's 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 a blessing and it's a curse it's a great thing and it's a pain in the neck the 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 reason yeah. why it's like it's a pain in the neck because if we could all just be happy with what we've got and just settled then kind of that that would be that but because we're constantly striving for the next thing and we always think the grass is greener and we always think that happiness is just around that corner or just around the one after or it's with you know that person or it's in a relationship with that person so many people look for happiness with in a relationship and, th- and that's why you can see people jumping from relationship to relationship constantly leaving one and getting into the next because actually they're, they're trying to find ha- somebody who will make them happy rather than being happy themselves finding someone else who's happy themselves and putting those two things together to make a great life that rarely happens everybody's lots of people are looking for happiness with other people and so if we constantly believe that happiness is just around the next corner then we'll always be plodding we'll always be walking we'll always be running we'll always be turning around that next corner expecting that that's where we're going to find it and then we don't so i think um for me it's what i'm doing now at a bigger level but the truth is that i truly 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 enjoy everything that i do every day because i've engineered my life to be that way sure things are difficult sure you face struggles every now and then sure you face rejection and sure you face um upheaval and sure things go wrong and I kind of look to enjoy that. I kind of look to say, okay, but that's a that's a that's a learning opportunity. What can we do with that? And and I enjoy the struggle. So a few years ago, in um, another business that I'm involved in, me and my business partner, we randomly found that we had like a a twenty six thousand pound tax bill. So that's probably like forty thousand dollars or something. Oh my, 40, oh my gosh. Yeah. And we just hadn't planned for it. And it hadn't planned for it at all. The money wasn't there. It was a new startup business. So like uh, it wasn't even making tons of money, but we just sort of messed up some accountancy stuff, taken some bad financial advice. And we ended up with this huge tax bill and the tax office in the UK wanted it now. They didn't want it in like 10 monthly installments of twenty two thousand six hundred dollars Like they, they were like, we want it now. And so we were like, well, that's going to like close the business down. We had a little office, we had some staff, like we literally had to sit the staff down one day and say, look, we might not be able to pay your wages at the end of the month because we've got to give all this money to the tax office or they're going to close us down. And so that was one of the most stressful, difficult times ever. But I woke up every day thriving, thinking this is a challenge. How do I solve it? This is difficult. How do we get around it? How do we make sure that we have the best possible chance of the business coming out of the other end of this, which it did? Or if it doesn't, and it all goes downhill and everything falls over and then we lose the business and we close it all down. How can we make sure that at least like we gave it our best shot and we enjoyed every second on the way there? Because otherwise, again, these things that are completely outside of our control, that thing was outside of our control because we were taken, we took bad advice from a bad accountant and it ended up in this terrible mess. So that was more or less outside of our control because we didn't understand the thing. It's a specific type of tax. And, um, and so because that was outside of our control, we only had two choices. One was to ignore it and run away and cry. Uh, and the other one was to say, okay, well, we can't control the fact that it happened because it's already happened. You can't control anything in the past. So we can't control the fact that it's happened. So all we can do is control how we feel about it and how we react to it. And should we just tr- chose to focus on that. And was it easy? No. Was it worthwhile? Definitely. So I think, um, yeah, I think for me, all I want to be doing is what I'm doing now at a bigger level, pursuing new things, asking new questions, trying like, you know, if a new opportunity arises, then assess it and decide if it sounds like something fun that, fun and interesting or not. Um, say no to more stuff because uh, I'm probably a bit guilty of saying yes to things that I don't really want to do. Um, and yeah, I think it, all of those things are a key to, to being happy in, in the now as well as in the future. 
Yeah, you know what? You said the most simplest way of happiness is in the journey. Because you know what? People, um, I, I, I kind of get over disillusioned and definitely upset that, you know, the only way to achieve success and be happy, you have to go through the rough. You have to have all these challenges now because, you know what, Lisa, if you go through it now, you, 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 you have success in 10 months or 90 days from now. And I really don't believe in that. Like, I really don't believe you have to go through something rough or terrible to have success. I think success really is in the process. So, Rob, as we continue uh, our conversation, I, I want to get more detail in your life. You know, overcoming happiness and doing all this, this is marvelous. So at what point did you have to uh, challenge your mindsets? When was it where you said, okay, I got to do something different. And if I don't, this will happen. Like, What, what did that look like? Yeah. So I think uh, after that very first magic show, when I was a little kid, when I was 10 and I couldn't really do it properly and I got in the car and cried all the way home, I really knew that at that point, and I, I do remember having this thought, I do remember having this thought, and that, that was that there was only there was only two choices at this point. You could either give up and walk away and say, oh, well, that's that then. Or you can say, well, I'm going to try and figure out how to do it. I'm going to try and use the constraints that I've got and use them to, to create some sort of superpower. So, and I think it's a really good sort of model for life generally, really looking back. And that is, if you look at what the constraints are, look at what the things are in you or in your life or in your surroundings or in your situation that make a thing that you're trying to do difficult. So for me, it was the fact that I want to be a performer, yet I'm incredibly shy and quiet and don't like talking to people and, and just find interaction very difficult. So that's a constraint, right? The constraint is... I'm shy and quiet and reserved. That's a thing that isn't naturally conducive to being a performer or an entertainer. So if that's the constraint, right, if that's the limitation, then how do we work within that constraint? How do we work within that limitation? How do we use that as a springboard to do something else? So I started to assess stuff. So I looked around and I thought, well, do you know what? There are some magic performers, which is at the time what I wanted to do. I hadn't discovered stage hypnosis at the time. There are some magic performers who only perform to music, right? They don't talk. They just walk on stage. Music's playing. If you think about the big illusionists in Las Vegas, a lot of the time they don't talk at all. Um, and if you go on like a, a cruise ship where you might have lots of different nationalities, they, they often have a magician who doesn't talk at all because there's different nationalities and different language barriers and things. So I thought, great. Well, with, within the constraints of me being who I am, there's a thing I could do. I could probably do that because I was able to just stand there and silently demonstrate those magic tricks. Now, this is an obscure example because most people listening to this won't be a magician or want to be an entertainer, but the concept applies in everything. So if you can say, well, these are, these are the constraints that are either put on me or I've put on myself or, you know, like, and, and those could be things to do with phobias, fears, uh, attributes, personal characteristics, that kind of thing. Or they could be physical things from the environment around you, like, um, you know, unsupportive family, unsupportive friends, uh, bullies at school, you know, anything. There could be anything from the world around you, difficult colleagues at work, anything. If you can look and say, well, what are the constraints that I've got that are being put on me and how can I work within those constraints to do something different? So my initial reaction was, well, great. In that case, I'll, I'll be one of those magicians who does everything to music. And you know what, then at that point, every school talent show that came around, every like local talent show that was organized by like the local councils and things, I would go out and I would do a magic act and I put it together with no talking. It was just me stood to music. And what started to happen was that started to train me to think, actually, do you know what? I can do this now. People find it, uh, you know, people are appreciative of it. I get up on stage, people clap, they laugh when something funny happens. Like I don't have to talk at all uh, though, and people are enjoying it. And so what that starts to do is that started to build what I consider to be the first core pillar, there's three, the first core pillar of confidence, which is evidence. It started to build evidence that I was worthwhile, that I could do something, that people would like it, that it was worth me continuing doing. And if I continue to do it, people would continue to like it, even though I still wasn't talking at all, just going out on stage with music playing and doing stuff to music. Um, that started to build this evidence that actually, do you know what? You've got a chance. You could be a performer, even if it's not the performer, the kind of thing that you dreamt of as being as a kid. Like you've got, there's something you can do because I just chose to work within my constraints, which is I'm terrified of standing on stage and talking. And as you start to build the evidence, as you start to build the evidence that actually you've got something to offer, you've got something to deliver. One day, I literally, after ages of doing that, I just said, you know what? I'm going to go out there and I'm going to try and do something with words. I'm going to try and I'm going to come on. I'll do something to music for a bit first, and then I'm going to try and talk. And if that all goes wrong, 
If I can't do it, that's okay. I can just go back to doing what I was, what I normally do. And nobody would ever really notice. If I, if I kind of bottle it at the last minute and give up, then I can just go back to what I was doing and nobody will ever know. And I went out on stage and I did a bit with music and then I started talking and it went absolutely fine. And all that happened was I'd given myself a period of, I don't know, months or a couple of years of just doing something within my constraints that allowed me to say, actually, to build up this evidence that actually what I was doing is beneficial. And again, I know it's an obscure example, and I know it might feel like that's so different from your situation, whoever you are listening to this right now, but that's just not true. If you just work within your constraints, like difficult colleagues, unsupportive parents, bullies at school, a job that you don't like, if you work within your constraints and say, well, I can't do what I would normally do because I'm going to do this instead. And that is the first step towards pivoting towards where I ultimately want to be. And so that's what I started to do. And and eventually that built up enough evidence that it made a difference and it allowed me to change fundamentally at my core, what I was and wasn't able to do. Because of course, all of this stuff just comes from the stories we tell ourselves in our, in our, in our own brain. Mm. So the, the critical steps in this is your thought process, a mindset, right? Which can be something you've been raised with because you got support, you have been resilient. Is that it seems to me is that obviously if you are in an environment or if you're in a certain situation, you just don't like, let's say, for example, you just don't like your coworker, right? So we tend to focus on, I just don't like my coworker. And we tend to manifest, I just don't like my coworker. So you find every reason why we don't like them, right? So it seems what you you need to do to over, you did to overcome this is that you said, what are my constraints? I say in this context, you can't quit your job because you don't like your coworker. So what can I control or I'm in charge of that can help me either grow or create more understanding rather than more resistance. And when you start working within those constraints, you start building more blocks into your mind cognitively. In addition, what you start to do, you start to realize I can do this. So is that kind of what happened in, in this particular uh, incident? Yeah, exactly. And and the second bit of all of that. So the first bit is evidence. The second bit is effectively reps. So like when, you know, when you go to the gym, right. And you're going to do some weightlifting, you sit down, you pick up the weights. Nobody ever got ripped by picking up a weight, doing one bicep curl, putting it down and then leaving, going home and having a cake. Right. So we have to do, we have to do more and more reps. And so the, the next thing that happened was, as I started to build evidence that actually this is okay. And I can do something that's a bit more difficult than I thought it was going to be, or I thought was going to be impossible for me to do. I then said, well, in that case, I'm going to do it again next time, right? I'm going to do it again. I'll just do what I've done today. I've proved I can do it. I've got evidence. I'm going to do it again. So the next time I go out and do a thing, go out and do it again, right? And then the next time you go out and do it again. And I think getting those reps under your belt is really important too, because the more you do it, the more the more reps you get in, the more evidence that builds and the whole thing becomes a sort of self-fulfilling cycle. But uh, furthermore, the next bit from that is to increase the resistance. Because of course, the other thing is that any, per- I'm not a personal trainer at all, but any personal trainer would tell you that actually... Um, once you get past a certain point, continuing to do like, you know, do bicep curls with the same weight um, is actually going to be counterproductive. It's not going to get you any further forward. It's going to tie you out. You're not going to get anywhere. At some point, you're better off to increase the weight, to increase the resistance, to make it more difficult and do fewer reps with something that's more difficult. So the next bit was, okay, great. In that case, how do I take this thing that's difficult and make it more challenging? So for me, those are the three ingredients of confidence, right? It's building evidence, it's getting reps and then building resistance. So um, how do you initially just get a bit of evidence that there's something there? Once you've got that evidence, how do you do it more and more and more often to build uh, build up the reps and build up more and more of that evidence? And then how do you make the thing you're doing more difficult? How do you increase the resistance? So how do you make the running machine faster? How do you make the weights um, uh, heavier. How do you make it so it's more difficult, which means that it stretches you further, it pulls you further outside of your comfort zone, but just gradually a little bit at a time, right? And so when you combine those three things together, and that's literally the journey I took, it was only in the future reverse engineering this that I realized why it worked and what happened or what I believe happened. But effectively, what that means is that, you know, so the first the first little magic show I did, I went out and it just fell flat on its face. I said, okay, great. If that's the case, I need to work within my constraints. Again, I was only 10, so I didn't think about it with these words, but came out and said, in that case, I'll just do it to music. Great. Did that for ages and ages after getting lots of applause and people seeming to enjoy it. I thought, great. In that case, I feel, I feel better about myself. I feel more worthy. Then able to start talking again. I didn't think I'd ever be able to do that uh, on stage. And then that got more and more, uh, more and more easy to do because the more I did it, the more evidence you build up and then you can start to increase the resistance. So I could start to talk for longer, start to do stuff more difficult. And you can apply this to doing presentations at work. You can apply this to going to job interviews or on first dates or any of the stuff that's going on in your life. Find the little thing you can do, the little 
um, least terrifying version of the thing that you really want to be able to do, the thing that's going to make you really, truly happy, the thing that, um, that you will wake up every day and enjoy if that's what your life looks like. And slowly just make it more and more, do it more and more and make it more and more difficult along the way. And as you build evidence, resistance, evidence, reps and resistance, then you start to uh, lift yourself up higher and higher towards the things that you're able to do. Perfect example. Um, so in my previous lifetime, I was, a, I own my, I still do, but I own a personal training business. I train clients one-on-one in person and online. And what was very kind of awe striking for me is, you know, you tend to compare yourself to them. Like I spent years competing in bodybuilding shows. I spent years of, uh, you know, my own insecurities and perseverance. I just spent time in the gym. You got a lot of people that I call gun ho. The first of the year, they want to get in the gym for six weeks. And after six weeks, they, they, they peter out. They can't see what's happening. Life takes over, whatever, right? They don't do the reps. Or I have some clients that have been with me for years and they're afraid to, let's say you go from a 10 pound dumbbell to 15 pound dumbbell. First thing, oh my God, it's it's five pounds more. Oh, I, I can't do this. I, I just can't do it. It's too heavy. So automatically they're already talking themselves out of at least trying, right? What's the worst thing can happen? You do bicep curls with 10 pound, 10 pound weight, and you got good at 10 reps. You pick a 15 pound dumbbell and oh, I can only do three. But yet you create more more neuroblasticity. I can do it. In addition, your body get used to it. Before you know it, that ten pound dumbbell that was easy now fifteen pound dumbbell now becomes easier because you do the same reps because it's getting outside your comfort zone and repetitions. And then when you said the gym experience, I resonate with that because I've been in the gym for years and still do it now. I'm training clients for different mindsets. The client that always says, "Hey, let's try a little more weight. Let's see." Is a client that will at least persevere. The client that says, let's try, hey, let's try five or 10 more pounds. Oh, no, 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 I can't do it. I don't, I don't want to do this. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And they freak out um, because it may be, for them, maybe too too much, right? I mean, depending on what you're doing, right? I mean, I'm not saying, hey, let's go from squatting 100 pounds to squatting 300 pounds. No, I'm saying let's go from squatting 100 pounds to squatting 100 pounds, 110 pounds. Let's see what happens, right? They depend upon their disabilities. But it's you, you said it right there in a really pivotal way that everybody can relate to. I mean, you know, but doing push-ups, doing sit-ups, doing jumping jacks, running a mile. This is all people can relate to around the world. I, I love that, Rob. I think there's a real thing where if you sat in a really comfortable armchair, right, and you've been sat there for a while, um, it's hard to get up. It's because you're in this, you're in this lovely place. You think, wow, I just don't want to get up. But if you imagine, right, that just in front of you, you're sat in this lovely armchair, and just like an inch in front of your toes, your feet are flat on the floor, and just an inch in front of your toes is a is a two hundred thousand foot drop down to the middle of the earth. You're even less likely to get up, right? So if you think that there's this huge colossal pit in front of you that you're going to fall down and everything's going to end, then you're absolutely absolutely going to stay in your armchair. And so I think a lot of the time, not only do we do we lock ourselves down in this armchair because it's such a comfortable place to be and the longer you're sat down, we all know this, the longer you're sat down on the evening watching the television, the harder it is to physically get out, right? So that's the case anyway. But if you think that the thing in front of you, the thing that's like terrifying is this big, horrible drop, you're even less likely to stay. You're going to like glue yourself down into the chair and strap yourself in so you can't possibly get up. And I think the thing for me is I always think you've really got two ways to look at something scary. You can either say, oh, but what if it doesn't work? And what if that doesn't happen? And what if I fall over? And what if I look like an idiot? And what if everyone laughs at me? And what if it goes wrong? And what if I can't do it? And what if I fail? And what, blah, 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 blah. Or you can say, but what if it's cool? And what if it's awesome? It's the same words, just with a different emphasis. Like, what if it's amazing? What if, it, what, if, what if it takes off, right? What if I start that business and this amazing thing happens? What if I go to that job interview and I get the promotion? What if I go on that first date and I meet the one? Like just, so for me, it's the same words. What if this happens? Um, but it just flipped around. It's literally just the emphasis. If you were going to act it out, it's oh, what if compared to, oh no, what if? So Rob, let me ask this. Um, as we get to the end of our podcast, um, I always like to kind of, there's always says it has to be a takeaway, right? You know, we've been on this podcast. I'm here. First thing is thank you because thank you because I believe one concept I will always live by is that we're a teacher and student at the same time. What you're teaching me in this podcast, I'm going to use some of these kind of breadcrumbs, not breadcrumbs, some of these kind of nuggets to use it when I coach my clients because it's like these are valuable, right? As, as the world wakes up and we want to look at things different, we're changing what you're saying to me is valuable. So what I want to know, you know, it can be one to five sen sentences long. What is the biggest takeaway from this? So for our audience, what are they going to gain? What can you say to them? 
I think one of the most important things that you can install into your life is a sense of curiosity, right? Humans are naturally just quite curious about things. We like to learn. We like to discover new things. We like to, to do that. But I think if you can take it to the to the nth degree, if I think if you can take it to the next level um, with curiosity, that allows you to do so many things. It allows you to have a natural assumption that there's loads, there is loads to learn that you don't already know. There's this concept in life of um, when you start something new, right? So here's an example. I've just bought an electric car. Right. So I've always just had a normal car, a petrol diesel car. Um, and, uh, I've just bought an electric car and it's not going to arrive for a few months yet. Cause they've got to build the thing, but I've just, I've ordered it. Like the order's in money's done waiting. And so one of the things I realized is as I made this decision, one of the things that pushed me to do it is that they're, uh, the government in the UK are giving a grant on the electric charging point things for your house, but it runs out at the end of this month. And so that really pushed me to say, well, do you know what? I was going to do it. I've been thinking about it. I want to do it. I might as well do it now when I get this grant. And as I pushed into it, that means I very quickly just went for it. And I realized that there is so much stuff that I don't know, I don't even know. And I think this premise of, the, of, of you know, when you don't know what you don't know, there are so many questions I've got. So I took to Instagram. I did an Instagram story and I said, where are my followers with a, with an electric car? And did the little pool thing where they can say yes or no. Bunch of people said, yes, great. Some of those people I know well enough, I just slid into their DMs and said, hey, tell me everything I possibly need to know about having an electric car. And, uh, and that worked out, right? Because when you're in a position where you just don't know what you don't know, you have so much to learn beyond what you possibly thought. And so I think just to approach life with a sense of curiosity really, really helps. The assumption that you don't know, that there's a, a lot more that you don't know that would be useful than that you do means that you become a lifelong learner and you're constantly trying to dig into more and more stuff. But also, again, this sense of curiosity that leads you to think, well, what if it goes amazingly well instead of what if it's terrifying? So I think if you can replace fear with curiosity and if you can f replace um, a sense of um, sort of uh, self-certainty sometimes with a bit of curiosity, that's not the same thing as fear or self-doubt. It's, uh, it's the desire to grow. And I think that will serve you really, really well. So um, I think if you it enables you to push yourself further and faster to do stuff that would otherwise be scary or terrifying and the stuff that you really know you should do, but you just don't really want to do. Oh my God. I just got blown back like a tornado, buddy. Thank you for all that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And again, I think it comes down to, it harks back to what I said before. I think it all harks down to the fact that every day, even if you're not where you ultimately think of as this sort of picture of like this postcard picture of, of what happiness and success looks like, you'll, you have to realize you're never going to get there. Because like I said, when you get there, you'll, you'll paint that picture differently. It'll look differently. It'll be brighter or bigger or bolder or something different. Um, or completely different. Like it might be where you get there and you go, wow, this isn't at all what I expected. I actually now want this and you'll paint like a totally different picture. But um, I think if you, li you live with purpose, if, and, and this is going to vary from person to person, you live with purpose. If fundamentally you wake up every day knowing that you are one step closer to where you to that, to that sort of current picture. I, I always think of that big picture as being like your vision for life, like a life vision. And the goals that you have are just the sort of milestones along the way to get from here to that big vision. And what that allows you to do is if you kind of set goals and you achieve them, sometimes those goals can be dissatisfying, or even if the goals themselves are satisfying, you're now dissatisfied because you've got to set new goals or, sit, or stay still. And both of those things are quite dissatisfying. Whereas if you think about this vision as being like where you ultimately want to be in the future, that's a very um, transient thing that changes a lot and very quickly and very easily, just subtle changes, big changes, bold changes. It's constantly evolving because the minute you try something and you realize, actually, I don't like that thing at all. Well, that now becomes a less important part of your vision. It has to, otherwise you're building towards something that when you get there, you're going to hate. So for me, that that's a, that's a big thing. So you live with purpose. If every single day you kind of wake up and you know that you're moving further towards that vision, even if today you're actually further away. And this is where there's a weird contradiction. If you wake up today going, do you know what? I did this thing yesterday and it just didn't work and it hasn't moved me forward. And I'm really annoyed. In fact, it sort of set me back a little bit. Even though you might be set back on a linear journey towards that thing, you're actually further, you're actually closer to it because you now know at least one thing that potentially doesn't work and you might want to try a different route. And so if you, um, like if you look at one of those little puzzles that you used to get on like cereal packets where you've got like a little character on one side, like a little mouse on one side, a little piece of cheese on the other side, and you've got all the tangled lines and you've got to try and figure out which line gets you from him to the cheese. 
that thing. The first time you do it around the little maze, you might end up in like a, a dead end and you have to go all the way back to the beginning again. But you're actually now closer to solving the puzzle because you know which way not to go. And so I think a lot of the time we feel like a setback pushes us all the way back, but actually it's just moving us slightly closer, albeit around the houses a bit, but it's moving us slightly closer to where we ultimately want to be because you learn from that. And so I think if you think about it that way, you wake up every day and just pursuing that little ne next little step forward, um, then you are ultimately living a life of purpose and happiness. And that's where I feel like I am right now. Awesome. Look at that. I, I like the little maze. <laughs> The little maze analogy, you know, there's multiple ways to get to the maze, right? So there's only one way to get to the maze, but multiple directions. And even if you try, let's say 10 times, you go the wrong direction 10 times, that 11th time may be the right direction. So all it does is reset you back. Okay, that didn't work. Let me try this. Okay, that didn't work. It's just a process, process of really elimination. Exactly. Find what works. Yeah, and you get closer. Totally. Totally.